Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our March edition of our lecture series at the Ethan Allen Homestead. Today, we have Andrew Bopri with us. And the topic, uh, the title of his uh, talk today is The Archaeology of Colon Colonial Conflict Along the Lake Champlain Border. This presentation will focus on the role of historical archaeology in presenting a more complete version of settlement and conflict in the Lake Champlain and Richelieu River Valley during the 18th century. Now we we're recording this, pre, uh, you know, earlier in the, in the uh, week here. The talk will be presented on March 20th, as you're sitting here watching it, and we will have a question and answer period afterward. If you are on our contact list, you will have already received a Zoom link for the live question and answer period. If you do not have that uh, Zoom link with you right now, send an email to Ethan Allen Homestead at gmail.com. Ethan, Ethan Allen Homestead at gmail.com. And we will send you the Zoom link and you can join Andrew for the question and answer period. Before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, without them, we would uh, really not be able to do many of, of the uh, events that we have at the Ethan Homestead. So we have AARP a a Vermont, Vermont Humanities, BrontonCars.com, 802 Cars, and Home Light Investment. So again, we thank them for their support of Ethan Allen Homestead. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Andrew. Andrew is the Arkansas Archaeological Surveys Research Station Archaeologist for the Central Arkansas River Valley. And he's also a research assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Arkansas. He earned a bachelor's degree in history and anthropology from the University of Vermont. His master's at West, Western Michigan University and his doctorate at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. His research interests include historical archeology, span landscape, heritage studies and culture contact during the French colonial period in North America. He has excavated in New England, the Great Lakes, Quebec, Alabama, Arkansas, and as far afield as Western Australia. To my knowledge, he has not dug in your backyard, but you may have to check that out yourselves. While still a graduate student, Dr. Bopri worked under the Canadian Department of National Defense as the field scientific director of the University Laval excavations in partnership at Fort Saint Jean, Quebec. Immediately prior to joining the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, he was the inaugural postdoctoral teaching and research fellow in the McCormick Center for the Study of the American Revolutionary Era at Siena College in Loudonville, New York. He has also taught courses at several colleges and universities and has worked as a cultural resource, resource management archeologist. The work you are hearing about today is the subject of his forthcoming monograph on border zone archeology. span With that, Andrew, I will let you take over. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and it's, it's an honor to be back with the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Um, those of you who have been around a while uh, might remember that you saw some of this research way back in its, in its infancy uh, when I was a graduate student and I was invited to speak in, in 2011. So it's been a while. Um, but thank you. And so I, I appreciate you, you showing up to listen today. Um, as John just told you, the, the title I have um, out here now is uh, about Archaeology of Colonial Conflict Along the Lake Champlain Border. Um, the more kind of saucy title, if you will, uh, if you will or the longer title, um, is um, driving this saucy Frenchman back across Champlain into his den again, um, colonial contestation in the Lake Champlain border. We're going to talk uh, more about that, but um, 
for those of you, you might, you might recognize uh, that quotation. It's actually uh, straight out of the introduction of the James Fenimore Cooper uh, novel, The Last of the Mohicans. And so my research in the Lake Champlain Valley really uh, deals with this time period of uh, the Seven Years' War and, and contestation for the Lake Champlain and, and Richelieu River Valley. Now, my association of my research with uh, the, the Cooper fiction is not my idea uh, only, is not novel. Uh, my late friend, uh, Dr. David Starbuck, who is an archaeologist looking at the Lake Champlain and uh, Hudson River Valleys for many, many years uh, while he was at Plymouth State, and he taught uh, another number of other schools as well, focused his research on this um, Euro-American, but really British and Anglo-American view of the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Valley from historical uh, archaeological approach. And he published a number of books. I would recommend um, checking them out. We just lost him this last year. It's a great loss to the historical archaeological community. Uh, he, was, he was a treasure, really. And he published a number of books, uh, The Great War Path, uh, The Massacre at Fort William Henry. His, uh, one of his more recent was The Legacy of Fort William Henry. Uh, and he also had um, Rangers and Redcoats on the Hudson. He had a large number of these books. And so what Dr. Starbuck's work did um, was really look at the historical archaeology and history of the Lake Champlain Hudson Valley from a very Anglo-American perspective. Um, and so my work uh, kind of picks up uh, on some of what uh, Dr. Starbuck did, but also I'm, I'm interested in this, as I said in the description, um, a more nuanced discussion, a more complete version of transnational politics. And what I mean by that is quite frankly, a, a more francophone or francophile-centered view of conflict for the colonies. And so that has a lot to do um, with the way that my research is shaped. It has to do with my experience as a graduate student and also um, my positionality personally. As archaeologists, we're anthropologists first. We study human interaction, right? And we have to be aware of where we come into the discussion as researchers. And so I have shaped a lot of my research on this idea of colonial landscape in the Lake Champlain Richelieu River corridor as a border land. And I call it border zone sometimes, but it's around the border. I think of border as a specific line and border zone is kind of the, the amorphous um, uh, it's been used before the term frontier, and I kind of avoid that term frontier, but the idea of a zone of interaction around the hard and fast line. And I look at this historically through documents and archeological evidence to try to understand the creation of this kind of hyper-nationalistic zone along the border that we, that we have today, right? And we're looking at broader interactions of two different, very different cultures that exist along this, the same border. Um, and I'm speaking of the American Can, you know, Canadian border here where we have a very kind of Anglo-American Vermont in New York on one side and uh, Quebec on the other with its very pro-Francophone uh, views. And again, talking about positionality, it is a, a matter of my own upbringing that this comes about. And so if you recognize uh, this map, this is the, the bottom part here is the Northeast Kingdom, right? Uh, just east of Newport. I um, was lucky enough to grow up in the kingdom um, in a little town called Morgan. You can kind of see the, uh, if you can see my mouse, there's a little shadow of Lake Seymour. That's where I grew up, right on the shores of Lake Seymour. But this area that's, that's you in the map, this was kind of my, my home range, if you will, especially as a teenager, uh, crossing that border and understanding what it was to be um, while I am a, a Francophone American or a, a descended French Canadian American from the French Canadian diaspora, um, my parents, or uh, grandparents rather, emigrated uh, to the United States. The, the notion of being both Quebecois and American along this border zone really had an effect on me. Um, if any of you have the opportunity and you haven't yet, please go check out uh, the Northeast Kingdom, specifically um, one of our great landmarks, the Haskell Library where there is literally uh, the US-Canadian border runs through the yard and uh, through the building, 
you can walk into the Haskell Library and be uh, completely within the United States and completely legal. And then you cross, this is the front reading room and there is a line on the floor, literally, that is the US Canadian border. Um, so check that out. But that, that view of borders are living on both sides of the border in, in a zone around the border, um, the modern US Canadian border really kind of um, colored the work that I wanted to do as a professional archeologist. So fast forward to then, um, I was approached by a colleague to become um, an archeologist for the Canadian government. I worked for the National Department of National Defense of Canada at a place called Fort Saint-Jean. You can see on the map here, and here is a, a zoom in of that site. And uh, it's a very Francophone city. Uh, Saint-Jean is on the same time that is a very federal government piece of property. It's actually still a military base and it has been a military base since 1666 uh, when the French army first settled in the region. And then you enter the, the young American graduate student there in the corner. Um, and it's very hard to see in this picture, but I'm actually wearing uh, an Army Corps of Engineers, a United States Army Corps of Engineers baseball cap. Um, one of my cousins works for the Army Corps, and so I borrowed his baseball cap for that photo to, to kind of feel like being a little bit of an American invasion. Um, but I was hired uh, to do an excavation at this one site of Fort Saint-Jean. Fascinating site in and of itself. Uh, located on the northern end of the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Valley, right? Or, or kind of in the middle of the Richelieu River section of it. And I started to think about uh, the site itself. And that was originally going to be the focus of my research as a graduate student was looking at the site itself. And it's, you know, the site is directly located on the Richelieu River. I mean, it's, it's right there. The fort had been built on the shores of the river. It was built in a strategically defendable position, right? It was built as most military ports are, uh, or forts are, with the idea of defense, right? It was uh, famous for being a site that was visited by Sam Champlain on his way south. He had to pull the canoes that he was uh, paddling with his Huron guides out of the river there. There's rapids, one of the things that makes it a defensible position. And then that same location, because of the rapids, because of this, uh, prime spot was selected by the Carignan Salier Regiment to build a fort in 1666. And then there was a supply depot built later and serve as an entrepot or depot for uh, entering uh, the colony as New France moved to the south. Now, one of the fascinating things about doing work at this fort as an archaeologist was that not a lot happened there. Okay, it had a it had a, an interesting uh, history in terms of you know, really little snippets, but there were no major battles. There was an American invasion. We'll talk about that another day. But I started to think more about the scope of this one little fort, which we can see right up here in, in the blue, as a larger regional piece. And as I mentioned in the introduction, my interest in landscape and larger kind of regional movements and understanding history at a grander scale than a single space, right, a single place. But it's always been that tie and association to water and to what water means uh, in, in the 18th century that really interested me. So, we, you know, as always, as historical archaeologists, we do background research. We can find these maps here. We can see uh, the Rapid Saint-Jean. This is the area where the fort uh, was built. And there's actually a ship uh, that, was, that was built there um, to ferry goods as we enter the, the 18th century to the, the Lake Champlain um, forts further south. And so as a graduate student, very focused on, on just one site and starting to get into these documents and understand that, okay, we have a, a historical fort here, but what does this mean? It's been studied multiple years. This picture is actually from the year before I was born. Um, here in the top right is an excavation that was undertaken by Parks Canada. And um, then my own excavations kind of tying these pieces together and trying to understand uh, the, the pieces of history in a multi-layer of an archeological site. When we look at archeological sites, we really are looking at them in a way of um, peeling back layers, almost like layers of an onion or, or layer cake. If you, if you attack a layer cake from the top as opposed to taking a slice out, trying to understand uh, all of the history and the trash that's built on one another. Right. And so always this tie seems to be coming back to 
to the river and the water. Until finally, um, when we were excavating in a defensive trench around uh, this fort, this picture of the fort I just showed you is from um, 1748, we found this really interesting artifact. This is two meters down, so over six feet down in the soil, really thick, heavy mud. Uh, when you're an archaeologist and you're digging and you're using uh, tools and you're excavating, it's always the last day, right? There's summer heat beating down. It's the last day that you have a really interesting discovery. And we were here in the last day of excavation, this, this artifact uh, popped up. And I hope uh, you can recognize it from the picture. It's actually a sheet of birch bark. And when I got to excavating this sheet of birch bark, it looks brand new. It looks like you had wandered into the woods and, and peeled it off of a tree. And it somehow ended up in this hole six feet down. But in dating it relatively to the other artifacts around it, we figured out that because of the anaerobic environment, there's no air down there, things don't rot, nice sealed wet mud. Um, this is actually a 200 plus piece, a year old piece of birch bark. And when you look closely at it, uh, you can see that there has been holes punched in it, regular holes with a, a round or, or diamond shaped tool. And there's been um, scoring that's been placed on it. And it's like somebody was actually planning to put these holes in, they made lines. And when you, we peeled these two pieces of bark apart, it's actually two pieces overlaid one another, we peeled it apart and there was an indication, excuse me, of um, wood glue, of actually a spruce uh, pitch wood glue that was gluing these layers of bark together that had been stuck together with a glue and then stitched, which immediately uh, my mind jumped to this idea of a birch bark canoe. Now it could be a number of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be a birch bark canoe. Um, there are a number of things that would have been sealed uh, in this way, but as it is, it's one of the only uh, pieces of incredibly well-preserved birch bark like this that's ever been discovered archeologically in North America. And again, the jump from the birch bark artifact to the fact that we're on this riverine site really brought me back to the idea, okay, we have a fort on a river and we know that it's part of this longer string of forts that really stretched down into North America during the 18th century or down to into the, what is now the United States uh, and pushed down from Canada. And so it was really the, the kick in the pants, if you will, that I needed to understand that the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Valley needed a serious investigation as a contested waterway. Right? And we know that prior to contact, prior to the French and the British fighting over uh, the colonies who would own North America, right? the area had been inhabited. It's not a tabula rasa. It's not a plain open space. right? And the Lake Champlain um, River Valley plays an important part in one of the Abenaki creation stories about Ozi Ozo and, and Dunder Rock right out in uh, Burlington Harbor, right? Um, we have that association in others' work about the Attawak or the waters between and what, what, are the, what is the water between or what is the river between as a border kind of idea of Lake Champlain cutting right down in the middle, puts us right between the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains, right? We know from historical documents that it's, it's a highway used by Iroquois raiding parties going into New France from the South, from what would become New York, right? Moving up and also an avenue of trade for native peoples coming down from Quebec and down from Vermont and New York over into the Dutch colonies and later the British colonies, right? And so this idea of contestation and this amorphous lump of water that's in the middle really got um, my imagination going, right? It is talked about in a very military history standpoint. You can read dozens and dozens of books on the military history of Lake Champlain all the way through um, the War of 1812 and the Civil War and the creation of Fort Montgomery, right? Um, but it's always talked about in a very kind of militaristic view. And then it's, it ends up again, back to the title of the talk, in this idea of pop literature, right? Of driving the saucy Frenchman, in this case, referring to uh, Montcalm, in the Seven Years' War, the Marquis de Montcalm, driving him back across Lake Champlain to his home in the north, right? So a, a, a north-south across discussion. So as archaeologists, we like to go back and 
and, uh, and look at things in, in a larger scope of understanding, all right, I've got a neat little a microcosm of study here. How do I, am I gonna understand this? How as an archeologist, am I gonna take the historical record that exists and jump in with an archeological record as well? In this case, I borrowed a, a model from an archeologist named James Dell, who, who looked at some uh, coffee plantations about power and space to try to think about, hey, how are these native people, French people, um, British uh, colonists that are coming in, how do they view that place they understand, right? How are they figuring out the Lake Champlain border? How does that work? Is it just, is it just a space? Is it just someplace you walk, like walking down the aisle of a grocery store? Or is there more to it? And my argument, and this, the, my dissertation is becoming the book, is that there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more to the way that anybody interacts with a space, right? And that's why I came up with this terming this uh, term border zone, which um, Thompson and Lamar, uh, other theorists have, have used the word frontier similar, but this idea that a border is not just a single line or a place. And if we talk about a border area, it's just a single line or place, it loses something, right? If only which way is the line, right? Which way is the border that we're talking about? I've gotten some kind of heady ideas here. I want to back up and explain kind of each step as how we manifest this idea of understanding space from somebody from the 17th or 18th century. How did they view their land, right? We're going to even go back before then now. We'll start with a pre-contact, right? And it's a, an, it's a recognized trope that Lake Champlain stood as a border between the Iroquois territory on the western side of Lake Champlain and what's now New York, right? And Abenaki territory on the eastern side of Lake Champlain now recognized um, by both the, the uh, or this territory is recognized by both the uh, four recognized bands of Vermont, as well as the Odenac, um, Abenaki, who are recognized in Quebec, right? And on the uh, western side of the lake, we have the Mohawk. And as archaeologists, oops, excuse me, we associate material culture with place, right? Material culture with people. There's a very old trope, pots aren't people, um, right? But that's a way that archaeologists make a tie between the people of the past and the people of the present is their stuff, right? In this case, a very Iroquoian looking pot on the west hand side of the lake and a very kind of Algonquin uh, style pot on the east side of the lake here. Now, it's not just archaeological data and artifactual information. So um, as anthropologists, historical archaeologists, we're going to go back and we're going to work on um, looking at many different avenues of evidence, right? We have the historical documentation, we have artifacts, and sometimes we use linguistic data, linguistic data that's recorded in um, documents, historical documents as well, right? Uh, in this case, um, something that's borrowed from, from Gordon Day's work and, and others looking at toponyms or just the names for different places on the landscape. And we can record toponyms that are largely on the western side of the lake or Mohawk toponyms, and those on the eastern side of the lake are largely um, Abenaki uh, toponyms as well, right? So when the French colonization settles and starts in the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Valley, we already have an idea of a border, whether it be an east-west border between the Mohawk and, um, and the Abenaki, or now we're starting to think about in the 17th century as the French start pushing down from the north, right, and French colonization happens, starting to look at the view of maybe the Lake Champlain, Richelieu River Valley is a, is a corridor where the border is going to move in a north-south as a horizontal organization as opposed to a vertical one, right? And so we can start pulling apart the layers of this onion and look at, okay, hey, this is a 17th century map drawn by a French cartographer. Where if you take a look here uh, and the zoom, the blow up, you have all of Lake Champlain listed as being part of New France. And in you know, uh, 1666, when, when this map is created, the idea that claiming Lake Champlain as part of the colony of New France was just the norm. But the norm from a kind of cognitive perspective in France. That's what the French think in Paris, right? In Versailles. Well, when we look at historical documentation and then archeological evidence from North America, 
you got a little bit of a different view, right? In this case, a very famous quote from um, the Jesuit relations, whereas we occupy the northern part of New France and the Iroquois occupy the southern, right? So this is a Jesuit in Quebec saying, hey, um, around the Lake Champlain Valley, that's really Ir Iroquois territory. We don't, we don't push down into that, right? And now as more European contestation comes in the area and the Dutch settle and build Albany, right? The French government in France says, hey, we can't have this. The Dutch are encroaching on our colony on the south end of that Lake Champlain Valley. We need to do something about that. So you get orders in 1663 that says, hey, the governor of New France suggests that we build three fortresses. The first in the place or the foundations of Fort Richelieu, which is way up here on the confluence of the Saint-Jean River or the Richelieu River, right? And the St. Lawrence, right up here, right? The modern city of Sorel is there. And then this order from France is calling for a second fort to be built all the way down on the same river where the Dutch have built their wretched redoubt that they call Fort Orange, right? So the French governor's calling them out and saying, hey, we want to keep the Dutch pushed in. We're going to go all the way down to the Hudson and build a French fort on the Hudson. And then the third one somewhere in the middle at the foot of Lake Champlain, creating a huge line of three forts that's hundreds of miles long, right? Over 150 miles long, which is unsustainable in 17th century uh, New World, right? There's no way they can build these three forts that far apart and have them survive. So what actually ends up happening in 1666, when the Carillon Salier Regiment arrives, is that we have five forts built, the furthest south of which is on Isle de Mont in Vermont here. So what now becomes the Fort, this Fort St. Anne becomes a St. Anne Shrine, right? That's as far as the French government gets in 1666 saying, hey, uh, that's as far as we can control. Because that they're pushing the border of what they see as New France to the south. And the last thing that they can really claim with any chutzpah, if you will, is on Isle de Mont, right? Which is a different view than you get orders from France telling you to do something and that the cognitive view or the idea of what New France is in France, and then the boots on the ground when we get to the material understanding of excavating these, these five forts. Uh, three of these five forts have been found um, in, in archaeological context, we think we know where the other two are. We just haven't located them, uh, again, with boots on the ground, or we call ground truthing, but really fascinating data about that, right? A difference between what people think and how they view an area in the past or how they feel about it, and then what actually happens, right? Still around that idea of pushing frontiers and borders, pushing that border zone, right? When we jump into the 18th century, we have a whole bunch of new ideas about what borders and boundaries are in France. And so the historian in me looks at a number of historical French documents. How are the French cutting up Europe? How are the Europeans engaging in this in Europe and putting up borders? Let's see if they're thinking about things the same way in the Lake Champlain Valley, right? So I've had this idea of this cognitive approach, the view, their mind's eye of what the place looks like. And they, the French talk about two different types of borders. They talk about le limite naturelle and frontier naturelle. I'll explain that in depth in a second, the difference between those, right? Where the limite is that separation between two political jurisdictions or territories, like a line, like a border line, as opposed to a frontier, which directly faces to an enemy, right? Not just a line on a map, but a defended line on a map where people interact on that map. Very, very different view. We'll explain that more in a second. Then also they have the seigneurial system, where by the 18th century, the French are deciding to cut up North America in the feudal system that they're used to in France. They're bringing their view of what it is to be a French villager or what it is to be a French lord, and they're dropping it in North America. They're expanding that colonial view. Right? And then they're also thinking like soldiers, huge portion of when we get toward that Seven Years' War in the 18th century, the contestation for control of the continent comes right through the Lake Champlain Richard the River Valley. And it's about positional warfare or the establishment of military posts, which is how I started this idea way back when I was digging at Saint-Jean, right? I start to think about 
military architecture as it pushes through. So just really quick, um, from the direct example in the Lake Champlain Valley of both Le Limite Naturel and the Frontier Naturel, we get it, we can pull it right out of historical documents. In this case, a Swedish naturalist named Peter Kahn, who has the opportunity to travel through North America to collect plants. And while he's traveling to collect plants and be a botanist, right, he records an amazing documentation of French and British colonial life in um, the 17th century, the 18th century, other 1700s. And he makes a comment about traveling through the Lake Champlain Valley, where he lists this idea of there are high mountains on either side and a valley in the middle, right? And so those high mountains, we can interpret as that le limite naturel in that French voice. Here is the colony of New France. It's coming down the Lake Champlain, which the river valley. It's controlled by New France, controlled by France, and we've got a border on one side of the mountains, we got a border on the other side, and we got the beautiful Champlain Richelieu River Valley in the middle that's going to be French territory, right? Then Kahn goes on to even give us another example of that frontier natural, of that facing to an enemy, where he quotes, on the eastern side, we can see in the distance the high mountains, right? And those are our green mountains here in Vermont, which separate Canada from New England, right? Already claiming that valley as part of Canada, as part of New France. The Abenaki Indians who wander about these woods are the worst enemy to the Englishmen, right? The Englishman's worst enemy. So there, the French are allying themselves with the Abenaki to protect their border here and using Abenaki allies as that frontier natural. And we can start to see as that border is now, hey, we just made this little bubble where the border is pushing down from the south and they got the Adirondacks on one side and the greens on the other and we're pushing down and through, right? So we can see those borders being written and we can start to see, okay, how does this fall archeologically? Well, let's look at it through the seigneurial system, right? Now, a lot of historians have looked at French colonization in the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Valley, specifically the Lake Champlain area as saying, I can't tell you how many times I've read this, they never really amounted to much, there never many French people, and you know the French never really settled anything, right? That's a very Anglo-centric view of American history, right? Like I said, being from the kingdom and being a Quebecois American, I kind of push back against that, right? Let's, let's look at historical documentation. And then let's take that a step further and look at archeology. span Can we actually find archeological evidence of French colonization, right? Well, hey, let's look at the historical documentation. Here are maps of the French cutting up Lake Champlain into their own seigneuries, into their style of, of French feudal land holdings, because they're planning on the lords that are going to come and take control of this, and people are going to live there. Right? There's a plan to settle that out. Right? Fascinating thing up here um, in what would become uh, uh, the Missisquoi Valley, right? And the Missisquoi River is shooting right out of Lake Champlain up here in Missisquoi Bay. The gentleman who ends up getting granted this piece of land as the Lord later served at um, the fort in Michigan where I did my uh, master's work, which is really kind of a neat tie for me personally. But the, the, these officers are all over North America that are being given these grants of land to become Lords, right? And again, did it ever actually happen in reality? Well, look at some satellite imagery. And you can see, we can associate what we call long lot agriculture, which is a typical view of the seigneurial system. On satellite imagery, we can see these long lots coming out in upstate New York and down here in Addison County, where French settlers are building their habitant households, their farms, and they're following that style of, of uh, land delineation where everybody has access to the waterway, that vital waterway or contested waterway, and moves back into the forest, right? And so we have that string of forts that then settle the Lake Champlain Valley, moving from where I was talking about at Saint-Jean up here to where I started work, uh, way up here in the north, Fort Chambly above that, and then Fort Ilnoua, Right on, on Ilnoua, there's a, there's a later fort there, Lennox, you can visit now at the Canadian National Site. And then down into New York, we have Fort St. Frederick and Fort de Pieux à Pante Chevalier. The first Fort St. Frederick habitation in 1731 was actually on the Vermont side of 
um, of the lake in, in West Addison underneath Chimney Point. Chimney Point gets its name from the French chimneys um, being there after the French are burned out and the British colonization comes through. And there are chimneys on the point from the chimneys of the French habitations. And down to Fort Carillon, which we know today as Ticonderoga. Again, from my earlier slide, Ticonderoga is a, is a Mohawk word, right? It comes from a Mohawk word. And so thinking about as the border shifts and changes through time, we can check these lines of forts and lines of settlement and, and verify with archaeology that there is French habitation. Now, in Vermont, New York isn't the only place this is happening. There are three, really three well-defined lines of forts like this in North America. Ours right here in the middle in the Lake Champlain Valley. Um, one over here between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia from Fort Gasparo um, down to Mestatouche. And over here from Presque Isle down to Fort Duquesne and what's now Pittsburgh, right? Great story about Fort Duquesne. That's where George Washington, the Seven Years' War, gets his butt handed to him twice uh, and loses as he's serving as a British militia officer. But understanding this kind of riverine map, I'm still trying to get my head around, or I was still trying to get my head around the idea of movement through the landscape. And I thought, what the better way to do that than understand movement through the landscape and understand how people in the past were going to understand space, then give it a try myself. Um, so this is the, the logo from a project I put together and was um, funded by uh, L.L. Bean Corporation as well as the American Canoe Association to paddle Lake Champlain um, from Fort Ticonderoga all the way up to where I was working at Saint-Jean. And I envisioned myself in this very kind of voyageur way, um, doing that in a birch bark canoe. Um, and uh, while I'm not a reenactor, I, I'm an academic. Um, my romantic view of my cognitive view of connecting with my voyageur ancestors turned out to be uh, much more like my future wife and I in a 17 foot Grumman aluminum canoe. Um, and, but we paddled this, this distance, uh, starting down at Ticonderoga and up um, the eastern shore of Lake Champlain, stopping at a number of sites along the way and trying to understand again how someone would have moved through this contested waterway in the 18th century, because it's going to be via boat. It's either going to be be a sailboat in the late 18th century or be a canoe in the beginning of the 17th and 18th century. And so, of course, a big site that sticks out in there is, is the discussion of Fort St. Frederick, right? This bastion of French settlement on Lake Champlain, um, built in 1733 uh, by the French government, it lasts until 1759. And it is effectively an absolutely beautiful Loire Valley uh, French castle that is built on Lake Champlain. Now, other archaeologists have investigated this as well, namely um, Paul Huey, who's for many years with the New York State um, uh, New York State Parks Department, and looking at a lot of these historical maps about the fort itself, and it was a real concern for British colonization at the time. And these are maps that are drawn by spies to record the forts uh, on the Lake Champlain Valley because it's pushing down too close to Albany and too close to that core of British colonization in the New World and the colony of New York. But even these later British maps, and there's our mention of Chimney Point again, these later British maps are showing the abandoned French settlements and the farms and the lines of trees that are indicative of orchards, right? And we have very the, the famous apple that comes from the, the snow apple that is uh, from Chimney Point is actually descended from a Canadian apple that was grown on Chimney Point and still can see, be seen wild there and is now um, being recultivated again by individuals for trying to save that, that uh, variety of apple. So we have that historical documentation. When I wanted to engage with this site from the riverine landscape or from the lake landscape as an archaeologist, you know, Again, it just looked so impressive. It was a four-story tower keep in the middle. And now uh, this was actually a photo I took from the old Lake Champlain Bridge before it was demolished. You can travel it now. It has a slightly different view of, you can see um, the remains of Fort St. Frederick right here on uh, Crown Point, New York, in Crown Point, New York, as you cross the Champlain Bridge from West Addison to Crown Point. And it's an open park, and you can walk through it, and you can see the remains of the fort that are left, right? And then when you visit this site now, the British, after they took over the area, they later built His Majesty's Fort at Crown Point, this massive earthwork, which dwarfs the little French fort here. 
But at the time when the French fort was built and the valley was French in the 1730s and 40s, Fort St. Frederick was the pinnacle of French civilization in the southern end of New France. It was the furthest south coast until they built Fort Ticonderoga in 1755. For almost two decades, this was the customs house. It was everything. And if you look at it from the lake level, even in ruins, it is still impressive from that lake level. Right? You can paddle right up to it, and you can see it's built on the rock outcropping, and this is the remains of what would have been the four-story keep and tower. As an archaeologist, with the benefit of modern uh, technology, we can do what we call view shed analysis and look and say, hey, you know, but it only, the fort itself would only have been able to view to the north when the attacking enemy of the British is to the south. It's kind of a really interesting discussion, right? It's a very interesting dichotomy. A fort that's built and it's absolutely gorgeous and it's designed to protect the people of the valley, but it doesn't have any strategic advantage. Looking, looking back home, right? And when you partner it with the other French uh, buildup in the area, we can see that there was a windmill further down on the peninsula, which is actually uh, down around here. And you can see further south, and you can use the windmill. It is mentioned in historical documents of using the windmill as a redoubt, as a, as a, a watchtower, if you will, to see if anyone was attacking up the lake from the British colonies to the south, right? But when I was visiting this site and, and understanding it from the water, realizing that it wasn't built as a strategic position, right? Um, but it was built more as a symbol. And it was built as a symbol of a cognitive view or, or a, a mind's eye picture for the settlers of the Lake Champlain Valley. These French people who are living all around, all around the fort here, uh, there was French settlement on both sides of the lake here. And you can see again some of that long lot of agriculture remains. So the French colonization is happening there. The fort stands as a symbol, and not only as a symbol that they can they can view and see, but as almost as a, a view of an auditory landscape as well. Because you can hear anything, you can hear a pin drop at night in the southern end of Lake Champlain. Um, I was proven when I was actually doing the paddling trip and camped here at um, the French cabin site over in DAR State Park. And all night long, you can hear Mack trucks hit the deck plates on the Champlain Bridge. And as you can hear those trucks crossing over the bridge, uh, the immediate thought was a shout that comes from over you know, two and a half kilometers away at the fort or a single uh, pistol shot or rifle shot, it's gonna be heard throughout the entire valley. And you can see that the, the individuals who would have been living in the Champlain Valley at that time would have been associated, the French individuals would have been closely associated um, with that fort and that, that uh, feeling of home and that castle that brings them back to the feeling of what it's like to be a French uh, settler or a French peasant living in France under the protection of their local lord in the castle and that being transported to North America, even if it wasn't strategically defendable from a military history standpoint. Right. There's, the, uh, there's that, you can go and visit some of those could be French, could be later uh, British cellar hole cabins. There's even grapes that remain on the shore there, and it kind of gives you that feeling of, uh, we know from the historical documents as well, that the French uh, planted grapes to make their own wine around Fort St. Frederick. It's a really interesting kind of tie when you go and visit these places, which I'd encourage you to do. Um, everything that I've mentioned so far is, is open um, sites, they're parks. It's a really interesting place to visit. Right. So just kind of wrapping up the thoughts on this, we as an archeologist or me as an archeologist with, with my colleagues, looking at that placement of borders through time and the creation of, of what we have as the modern US Canadian border. In between all of these forts, especially in the 18th century, there's this zone of contestation. There's a fear you're on the edge. You never know when the next attack from the enemy is going to come. And then literally for a hundred years, the British and French were at war on and off uh, over a hundred years for control of this contested waterway. Not to forget their native allies are with them all the time and having their own political understandings of the Valley of Wealth. So when the French are attempting to push the colony to the south, 
from 1666 all the way up here on Isle of Lamont down to Fort St. Frederick in 1731-33 and down to Fort Carignan in 1755. Right. And then we can gain that last step and understanding again from the Traveler Journal. Um, when the war is really getting going um, and the idea of the border zone between um, this border on Lake George and the southern end of Lake Champlain as the Seven Years' War begins, uh, in the, what we call the French and Indian War here, you have the British force to the south, Edward and William Henry, which play that role in um, the James Fenimore Cooper novels, and then Ticonderoga or Carillon, and the no man's land, if you will, between bring us back to our Swedish naturalist friend who makes the comment that I shall call the part of Canada a wilderness which lies between the French farms at St. Frederick and Fort Nicholson on the Hudson. Um, and uh, where Mr. Lionides and other Englishmen have their farms, not a human being lives in this waste region and no Indian villages are found here. It's a land left to wild animals and birds. So again, trying to look at that cognitive approach of designing a contested border from the past. This guy is traveling through and he's, he's freaking out, right? He's freaking out because he knows he's in the middle of a war zone. He has a pass to do it. He's being escorted by French soldiers and then they hand him off to British soldiers. He is completely legal to travel across this border through a war zone, but he knows it. And he's making up the story. Now we have other documentation. There were native people living there. There were animals and birds there. There was an idea there. It's not like a dead zone, right? But we also see in, in the kind of historical documentation sometimes, that the French soldiers are playing with him a little bit. Uh, you can read this longer bit, um, but he talks about tales of horror of killings and beatings to death um, from, from people that happen in this zone. Then he's talking about native people attacking in a zone that he said no one lived in a second ago, um, which is really interesting, but it's this cognitive view of borders where everything is a little, a little messed up, right? It's a little different. It's, uh, it's not safe anymore. It's an unsafe view, right? We call a safe social space, a place where you feel at home or uh, comfortable, right, is not going to be right along that border. That's a, a zone of, of, of fear, right? A zone of you never know what's going to happen, right? And so we have that safe space that was created by Fort St. Frederick, just like uh, Karakam is saying, north of St. Frederick and the farms around it, that's safe. That's a, that's a cool, safe place to be. South of there is dangerous, right? or north of Fort Edward, south of Fort Edward, where all the British are living happily in their own well ensconced in being in New England uh, or in New York, it's, it's very different than in the middle, right? And so then we have to look at how does this change? And the end of the Seven Years' War really brings that, that big change. Two big changes that kind of blow the idea of a safe uh, space for French villagers to live out of the water. One, siege warfare. Um, when big siege guns showed up at Fort Ticonderoga and then Fort St. Frederick and the British could attack with really big cannons and the, their symbols of safety, um, the, the more defensible fort at Ticonderoga and the more symbol of, of safe haven at Fort St. Frederick, when those could be attacked by serious cannons, the French are going to be freaked out by that. Uh, number two is actually terrorism. And I took a lot of flack uh, when I finished the dissertation, and I've been discussing this with my editor for quite some time about my characterization of um, otherwise American heroes, uh, Rogers Rangers, in a view of uh, as terrorists. Um, so over the course of 26 plus raids, uh, Robert Rogers and his Rangers attacked Fort St. Frederick, and this is all historically documented by Rogers' own hand, actually, um, where he killed cattle burned barns, uh, kidnapped women um, to ransom them back for information. Um, and one of my favorite examples um, was where one of the uh, Rogers Rangers ran out of the woods uh, near Fort St. Frederick and caught a French soldier outside of the fort in full in market day, on market day in full view of the settlers around, grabbed this soldier, uh, this French Marine soldier, and the Rogers Rangers scalped him and slit his throat in front of the market town and then just disappeared into the woods. Um, and so it's very much a terroristic way of combating on the frontier. Rogers calls it frontier warfare. Um, another word for it is terrorism. 
but it ended this, this kind of view of a safe social space of, of French settlement in um, the Lake Champlain Richelieu River Valley. As we know, uh, Fort Ticonderoga, or Carillon became Ticonderoga on July 26, 59, when it was burned and exploded. Same uh, four days later at St. Frederick, and the French uh, retreated back up into Canada or drove the saucy Frenchmen uh, back across their lake into the den in, in Canada. Uh, and so looking at one of these valleys in the larger scope of things, uh, it's fascinating to kind of tell, tell a viewpoint from um, an archaeological and historical record that's not often as explored, uh, and that being the kind of humanistic side of settlement of the French in the Champlain Valley. So thank you very much um, for listening. I am happy to take questions. Uh, if you're here for the live question and answer, uh, please also uh, check out, I had some, a lot of help uh, with my research over the years. And thank you for, uh, to the Homestead for inviting me. And uh, if you're not able to make uh, the live discussion uh, today on the 20th, please feel free to reach out to me via email and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Andrew, for this fascinating trip back in time. Uh, Having visited a few archaeological sites over the years, I'm always amazed at, as to how you folks can take small pieces of evidence and, and build a whole story around it. So this is pretty fascinating. I just looked at my desk and the, one of the books I had in my pile to read is called, uh, maybe you won't be able to see this coming up here. Uh, well, I'll just tell you the title. It, maybe you're familiar with it. It's called The French Occupation of the Champlain Valley, 1609-1759. And apparently it was written in 1938 by uh, Guy Omerin Coolidge, who is a relative of uh, Calvin Coolidge. So uh, it is, uh, it is a my great, it's a, it's a great historical version. Uh, a lot of primary source documents are in there as well um, that he references. Got great appendices in there. It's a great place to start. Um, former UVM professor uh, Andre. Senegal was was working on an update of that book. Um, he's also published some great stuff in the Journal of Vermont History uh, as well on Fort St. Frederick to take a look at. Uh, so I'm not the only voice out there uh, for the Francophone side of things, but, um, but there's some, some really interesting work. Okay, again, thank you very much. And we hope that many of you who are viewing this on the 20th will join us for the uh, question and answer period. Again, you should have received, if you're on our contact list, you have received the uh, Zoom link. If you do not have a Zoom link, send an email to ethanallenhomestead at gmail.com and we'll forward that, uh, we'll get that link to you so you can join us for the uh, question and answer period. Okay, thank you again. Bye.